Welcome to Finding Your Piece of the Rock on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Abe Lee. I have been a licensed real estate agent since 1973. I'm the owner of Century 21 iProperties Hawaii and work with close to 100 wonderful agents in real estate sales. I started AB seminars in 1980. I have taught over 11,500 students to help them get their real estate licenses and have taught continuing education classes for licensees to renew their license every two years. Our show is dedicated to helping buyers and sellers understand the process involved in a real estate transaction. Our special guests will talk about legal issues, escrow, title, getting a loan, surveys, home inspections, insurance, contracts, wills and trusts, and much, much more. Today, we're really grateful to have this beautiful young lady who has her, had her license since 2001, if you can believe it, which means that she's been in this business for 23 years, and I think she started when she was 10. So <laughs> we're really grateful to have Jennifer Andrews with us today. Jen, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Abe, and it's a pleasure um, and a privilege for, for being on this show with you. So thank you. Thank you, Abe. Thank you. Oh, and yeah, my you pleasure. Were, you were my pre-licensing instructor. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I had one good student. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jen, tell us a little bit about you, where you grew up, your family, what schools you went to, and how you got started in real estate, because you have a very interesting background. Well, my my father was military Air Force. Uh, he was in the Air Force for almost 24 years when he retired. Well, actually 24 years, and then he was able to retire. But he met my mom when he was stationed in South Korea. So we've traveled a lot since the time I was born between California, South Korea, Guam, and Hawaii. And we went back multiple times. So this is from the time I was born till the time of 1986 when we settled in, in Hawaii for my dad's, what he thought was the last station. And then he got it, um, a call about being stationed in Korea, South Korea. And my mom said, yes, take it. And of course he's like, I was ready to retire. And she's like, no, you're not. Cause we're going back to South Korea just so I could see my family. <laughs> so uh, my older sister and I, we were able to grow up in South Korea till I was about four years old before we moved to Guam. But my younger sister and brother also had the opportunity to live in Korea, which I thought was great because they get to know the culture, you know, where they're from. Yeah, so uh, we went back and forth. And then after my senior year in high school, I graduated at Seoul American High School, which is a DOD school. The Blue House, the Korean Blue House since has moved. That's their version of the White House to Young Sun Garrison. And um, came back to Hawaii, uh, went to UH, got my art degree. And everybody said, what are you going to do with an art degree? Because you can't make money. And I was like, mm. <laughs> that's that's true. Uh, even my professor, my uh, my se my last year, we we're doing the thesis. And my, my professor said, Jen, have you ever thought of doing real estate? And I was like, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> this is my this is right before I graduate with a with a fine arts degree. Are you trying to say something to me? He said, "No, uh, you know it's tough, and the reality of being a working artist is very is tough. So have you have you thought about what you would do in the interim? And real estate came up. I didn't know anything about real estate. It just happenstance a." a many people were just bringing up real estate and um when i was so that's actually the segue of me getting into real estate is you know coming back to hawaii getting my art degree and then everybody telling me uh you can't make a living with that <laughs> it's kind of like me getting a degree in asian studies at the university of hawaii <laughs> i knew i wasn't going to be an asian studies professor unless i got a phd which I didn't want to do. So I got into insurance sales and then real estate. So Yes. Yeah, buddy. But, yeah. But Koreans are entrepreneurial. And so you must have that Korean blood in you that has that entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, so I would say, yeah. Yeah, very, Koreans are very entrepreneurial, even if they have a steady nine to five job. 
in their in their mind they're still looking for something <laughs> okay so let's start off okay what did you do with your first company and how did you get started how did you pick them actually my broker so my other half of uh, Dan and I had been looking for a condo. And at that time, you know, it was 2000, bottom of the market, 10 pages of foreclosures. You remember those days. Uh, you represented a lot of HUD properties and it was all bidding a process. And, and um, we didn't have much money. Let's put it nicely, right? We And when we had spoke with a number of realtors, they basically all said, well, it's not worth my time because you don't have the dime, right? And, and, but luckily, we got in touch with an amazing realtor. He's, he's not in Hawaii anymore. Um, he, he has since moved to the mainland, uh, but his name is Philip Johnston. I don't know if you remember him. He was at uh, Premier Realty 2000, where I started, and took the pre-licensing class from you. And so he helped me um, and my half to get the condo bid and said, and he goes, Jen, why don't you get your license and work under me and I'll mentor you? And that's how I got into the business. Terrific. So then you've had a, what I would call a variety of jobs that very few realtors will ever have the experience of having. And really, I think it's going to take two shows to cover everything and what you've learned and what you can teach the consumer and the viewers, of course. So tell me about your, um, Experience about selling for a major developer because you were there mm. for a few years. And in fact, you yes. were the project manager. Yes, yes. I, um, and I worked with a state agency too. So that was different dynamics because you're not just working with the private sector, you're also working with the state sector. And um, what I found with developers really is. Well, it depends on the size. You know, I've done condo conversions that are smaller. But the larger developments were definitely a learning progress. Um, and when people ask me, how did you get to where you are? How did you learn what you what you know? I just tell them, just dive into it. Because you don't know what you don't know, right? And you're only going to figure out what you need to know is when you actually start to dig and dig deep. And that's at that time, I, I decided to take my CCIM courses. Because okay, I thought, well, hold on, tell yeah. us what CCIM stands for. Oh, it's a uh, certified commercial investment uh, member. So, you know, I didn't get the designation, but I was actually thinking if I'm going to work with developers, I need to know this background. And what I found was just like in residential sales, you're going to read a lot, but you're not necessarily going to use all of it. And it's on the job training. So for me, I was able to ask people who were boots on the ground, the superintendents, the people that were at the de development company and at the state, how do projects work? What does it take? And they're the ones that actually taught me about how to do a project, how to run a project. But what I can say is as long as the, the developer that you're working for is willing to work with you, then you'll be have a successful um project sales because it really is bringing everybody to the table and we did that every week literally everybody came to the table to have to find out what was going on with the project to keep it going seamlessly so can you tell us what was the project that you worked on mm -hmm. and was it focused on affordable housing or middle market or upper end and yeah. what was your responsibilities there so the first uh, first couple projects I did were actually condo conversions. So those are apartment buildings that were converted to condominiums. And those are pretty straightforward. Uh, but the major development projects that I worked on was actually with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And I worked with a number of different uh, construction partners that they had. So they do it two ways. DHHL will either be the developer or they'll be a partner. And if they're a developer, then they have to hire a contractor. If they're a partner, they do a JV. So I worked on Kanahili, which was 350 lots. And that was between DHHL and Gentry Homes. So you do a lot of prep work. It's a it's different than when I worked with Gentry in, in their private sector. So I was at Coral Ridge and Ke'ili'i, where you work with the public. 
the biggest difference I would say is um, the process. With going vertical, you have to have the buyers up front. When you go urban sprawl, single family homes, developers will usually build and then they sell. So it's a different process depending on the product type. But I have to say that DHHL project is still near and dear to my heart because it really wasn't so much about, I mean, of course, the homes, you can't, you know, it's a brand new home, but it's the legacies and the families, the generational dreams of home ownership and meeting those those goals for those families. That was the biggest reward. So um, it's not about um, getting paid. You don't get necessarily paid a lot on projects, but the rewards is the human touch, the human interaction, and you being able to be part of someone's journey. So with DHHL, if I'm not mistaken, you have to be 50% Hawaiian? To be an applicant, um, you, you must be 50% Hawaiian. And then if it's transferred, uh, then it, then whoever is it's being transferred to, if it's a beneficiary, meaning like it's a familial um, transaction to parent, to child, to sibling, then it's 25%. But if it's non-relationship uh, transfer, then it's still 50%. Uh, that That is something that they need to work on. And then you have to deal with lease land and not fee simple land. Yes. And what? How much was the lease rent? Lease is actually only a dollar a year, so it's essentially fee simple, and it's ninety nine years. And after the ninety nine years are over, uh, the beneficiary has the option to extend it for another ninety nine years. So essentially, two hundred years Amazing. at a dollar a year. <laughs> I would take that in RP. Yeah, <laughs> of course. What a deal. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So yes. you're dealing with new homes that were be being built for the Hawaiians? Yes, yes. And okay. it, it was the same development that Genchi would do in any other project that they have. Uh, the only difference is that it was exclusive to the beneficiaries because it was uh, a particular type of property and program. Okay. So taking that experience, how do you translate that to a regular citizen who's not Hawaiian? and who's a buyer, how do you help them to get over this fear of being a homeowner and having this humongous mortgage that's going to be paid in 30 years, 360 payments? How do you get them prepared? You know, interestingly, it's not different. The process isn't different in terms of what you're doing to counsel the client. Uh, when it comes to DHHL projects, the, the homeowners do need to take a home buying class. Um, first time home buyers so that they understand their budget and the counselor would teach them. I know you work with a Hawaii Home Ownership Cent um, Center, so say they also offer those same services to the beneficiaries. I think anybody who's interested in purchasing should take one of these classes uh, just for their information. But at the end of the day, if you're looking to buy a home, um, I would treat them no different. I tell them what to expect. Um, that there's going to be the unexpected that comes up, but there is a benefit to home ownership. It's it's knowing that you're investing in yourself. You can live, you know, subject to rules if it's in a project. Uh, but I also think what it is is you're you're investing in yourself, and you're, you know, looking to create wealth through real estate. And I think that's great. You know, it's a step up stone. I started in a tiny tiny condo. You know, I tell um, home buyers this too. You don't have to buy your dream home the first time. In fact, you're not going to get your dream home the first time. You may not be living in your dream home the fifth time, but you know, like, but it's a stepping stone and you work your way forward and don't overextend is what I tell them. So I work closely with them on their budget and expectations of reality of being a homeowner, meaning you can't just call the landlord and say, fix the leak. No, you got to call the plumber. You got to pay the bill. Yeah. Okay. Now you moved over to the Gentry market units. And how was that transition from working with DHHL to now selling to the general public? You know, uh, working with DHHL is definitely a lot more proactive because we're the ones as a sales team and as, as home buying counselors, in a sense, of reaching out to the home buyers. So we did about two years of prep work. Before, uh, before we went to what they call lot selection. 
and we did multiple presentations. So the time span is a lot longer to prepare buyers for home ownership with DHHL projects versus if you're going to market, basically a home buyer walks in, um, hopefully their, their agent, if they're represented, is there with them and they take a look at the property and they put their name on a list. It's, it's very different. You're not really working with them as closely from a market perspective because the buyer is a customer. And really it's, here's the product, here's the price, do you like it, buy it. It's, it's, it's really simple. You know, that's where a well-oiled machine, a great developer who's reputable and trustworthy, you know, like when they say they're gonna close, they're gonna close. Uh, and, and that's what made at least working for Gentry Homes so easy because they're very much so a well-oiled machine. Well, they've been doing that for a long time. 50 plus years, yeah. Yeah. And they live so, in the neighborhoods that they build, so it's important for them that they do it right. Sure. So with Gentry Homes on the market rates, units, sometimes you're dealing with outside brokers that bring in buyers, and sometimes people walk in, and then they don't have an agent working for them, but you're still going to be helping them to buy the house and go through the whole process. Mm -hmm. So how do you prep the buyers that are walking off the streets and don't know what to do and don't have an agent working with them? Yeah, if, if they are unrepresented or even if they are and they're not familiar, we definitely would sit down with the, the client and tell them the process or let's just say the customer, the buyer to tell them the process uh, because different projects will have different processes. If it's a affordable housing, um, Part of that affordable housing pool, they have to be qualified through, um, you know, the the HC, HHFDC to make sure that they qualify for those shared appreciation programs. If it's a market sale, a lot of times it's really just sharing what we do uh, as a developer. Totally different than if you're going to the resale market because you don't have all those contingencies, and it's not about, um, hey, I'm going to offer you this price. Developer sets the price, you choose to buy it or not. There's, there's not a lot of negotiations, but we do give them a timeline and a description of the construction process. Okay, so now you went then from there to a broker in charge. I, I, I'm not sure about the exact sequence, but you were a broker in charge of a Cobalt Banker office in Kailua as one mm -hmm. of uh, your responsibilities. How is that different? And what did you do to help your agents that you're responsible for? And then how did you train your agents to make sure that they took care of their clients properly? You know, I think uh, what is really important to have a healthy brokerage is to make sure that you understand the culture that the agents want. You know, a lot of times it's, it's what the management wants and it's not necessarily what the agents want. So when I was uh, promoted to take over the Windward office as the branch manager, uh, the first thing I said to the agents is, what do you want to see happen in this office? What is what is it that you don't like? What are the changes that you do want? And it was really more about having these open conversations with the agents. And the number one thing they said is, I want my broker to be available and I want them to be able to support me when I need them because availability with brokers can be tough, you know, and I had, and considering as a small office, I think we had about 60 agents, you know, whereas when I came from the other office, I had about a hundred agents under me. So training we did every week, uh, training I did, I never stayed in my office unless I needed to be. So unless an agent needed to sit with me confidentially, I was always out and about and walking around the office, making sure that everybody needed assistance. And I needed to know what everybody else did. My, my position as a managing broker or PB is, if somebody in the office is not available, I need to be the backup. So I had to learn everything. And to me, that's what you do. You show the agents, you, you learn, and then you pay it forward. And that's how they get to this community of, it's not a competition amongst us. We want to support each other and help each other get better and be better. So how did you go about maybe refining the training program that you folks had? Because you had a good training program, I know, with NATO or New Agent Training Organization. 
But beyond NATO, how did what did you do to implement a more thorough training program? Because the agents all need ongoing training, no matter what. Yes, yes. I I am a huge advocate for post licensing training. Um, and you can do an, a, a new agent training course, but it's not going to really be the same as if you have continual support. So I started to do a class called the Anatomy of the Purchase Contract. I started that when I first joined um, Coldwell Banker back in 2013 because there was a need for training. Um, for post licensing and and I would meet with the agents. It started off once a week and then it gradually went to every other week, but I basically take a full year to go over the 14 pages. And what we do is we go by contingency and we talk about it in depth. And what I found is that agents have really found that to be super helpful because RDR, right? Um, so, you know, uh, when you have to break it down and have real discussions, I think that's the biggest, um, for training purposes, I got the biggest feedback as far as this is what exactly I was looking for in training because you so, get to have so, real conversations. So just so know, let people know, RDR means realtors don't read. <laughs> <laughs> that's I why you need a class. <laughs> And I coined that phrase when I was teaching free licensing, and I say RDR, then I also say SDR, because students don't read. And yes. then they graduate to realtors, and then realtors don't read. But in your experience, as you've trained these people, are there things that the agents forgot or weren't taught properly? Yes. I would, I would have to say a lot of it has to do with not having the right coaching, the right type of mentoring, the right training from their brokerage. And they go on and a lot of agents say, like when, you know, as a PB, I would get agents who would tell me, I was afraid to call you because I would get in trouble. And I'm like, you're not going to get in trouble. In fact, if you don't call me, you will get in trouble. So call me. And I think that's the biggest thing is when agents, especially whether they're new or not, they don't call their broker for support because they feel they should know the answer. But that's what you have your broker for, to help you, to understand, you don't know this. So let's go over this together and provide a solution. Hey, you know that uh, time is fleeting by us. I think we have to have you come back for another uh, session here. But let's go through the questions that we had talked about. So what happened after Coal Banker and where did you go? Uh, Coal Banker, actually, uh, I was there and for five years as a manager. And then that's when Gentry Homes came back and asked me to be part of their sales team. I was with them previously as an outside broker doing their sales for seven, year, seven, eight years. Then they came back and asked me to come back. And I did that for two years. I opened up um, Ke'ali'i, which was their executive golf course homes. Before that, I was at Pearl Ridge, which was their previous executive uh, golf course home project. And then I realized I really like working in real estate, in the trenches. You know, I love Gentry. It was a great experience. I got to know more about the project sales from a different perspective. And for me, I'm always, I'm like you, Abe. I love to train. I love to teach. And I just felt like, okay, I love doing this. I love the people, but I need to get back into real estate. And that's when I decided to go back into, um, and I was hired as a PD at that time with Keller Williams. Okay, so tell us about Keller Williams because they're huge. Yes, yeah, totally different model. Uh, so that was a new experience for me. And again, new uh, uh, or different doesn't mean it's bad or good, right? It's just different. So for me, I got to learn a lot about that business model. Um, and as a PB, you're really working more with policies, um, any litigations or claims that come in. You're more, it's on the more of the legal aspect. But again, I worked very closely with the agent, so um, it was it was good to learn about that dynamic of the business. Because I ended up going, and right after that, I got hired by EXP uh, as their PD. <laughs> so, you know, Jen, we only have three minutes left. We definitely have to have you come back because we want to talk about your uh, workings as a volunteer with the City Affairs Committee. Uh, your role as a real estate commissioner, which is only one of nine realtors or licensees in the state of Hawaii. 
which is a very uh, prestigious position that you don't get paid for. But it's a wonderful opportunity to serve. And I certainly would love to talk to you about your duties there. Um, but EXP is a totally different animal, again, from Keller Williams or Powell Banker. Mm -hmm. So, well, I mean, you have to then, again, institute some training programs and uh, I guess I've, refining of the process. Yes. I have to say uh, the lack of structure was the biggest complaint from agents. When I went and I said, what do you like? What do you not like? Broker support, not to, to the fault of the previous brokers. I'll say that to the previous PVs. It was not to their fault. But I had to share with the brokerage. We are in Hawaii. We're very different than the other 49 states. We do things here differently. And I had to implement structure, policies, and procedures. And most importantly, training. The training was so key. And just that alone, being able to shift that is where we doubled in agent size. Because agents don't look at just the model. They really want to know is, the model is great, but how do I be a better agent? And how do I sustain a, this career over the years? And it all comes down to training. Now, EXP had about, what, seven, 800 agents? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. 700 when I left, yeah. Yeah. And Cole Banker was about seven, 800 agents also. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you work with some pretty big companies. Big companies as well as when I started, I actually wanted to stay away from the big companies. I wanted to be in a boutique company. So um, it's kind of interesting that as a new agent, I found a very, I was very fortunate to have an awesome, amazing group of mentors. Elliot Lau was on one of your previous shows yeah. and he was one of my mentors too. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, so to me, it's like interview different brokerages, see what fits your style. Um, and if it doesn't work out, that's okay, because your first brokerage isn't usually going to be your last brokerage. And now, we're going to just announce this, and some people know this, but Jen Andrews is going to be our pre-licensing instructor with me at mm -hmm. AB Seminars. So I'm so excited to have her, because as I mentioned, we taught pretty close to 11,500 students, and Jen went through the last session with me, and she was there almost every session which is really hard because it's Tuesday night, Thursday night, all day Saturday. But Jen is going to be a real stalwart to us and helping us with our pre-licensing course as well. So I'm excited to have her join us on our staff. We're out of time at this point, but Jen, we're going to have to schedule you to come back and talk about city affairs, the government affairs, and then the Real Estate Commission and other things I'm sure that we would love to hear from you. So thank you so much for being here. Time's flown. I know. Sorry, I talk a lot. I'm a no, realtor. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Please thank tell you, your Ange. friends. Oh, thank you. Please yeah. tell viewers, please tell your friends about this show. And it will be archived starting tomorrow. And then also we have other Think Tech Hawaii Finding Your Piece of the Rock shows. Also, if you go to ABD Seminars, you can learn more about our school, which Jen's going to be a part of, our staff. So thank you so much, Jen, and have a great week. this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.